First of Kings 17. But after a while, the brook dried up, for there was no rainfall anywhere in the land. Then the Lord said to Elijah, go and live in the village of, pronounce that word with me on three. One, two, three. Good job. Good pronunciation or enunciation, whatever you want to call it. Near the city of? What was it? Is it Sidon or Sidon? Huh? All right. All of you that vote for Sidon, hands up. All of you that vote for Sidons. Are you sitting on that? All right. Sidon wins. Okay. It's Sidon. So he said to Elijah, go and live in the village of Zarephath near the city of Sidon. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. Next verse. So he, who's he? Elijah. Elijah. Who's he? Elijah. You got you to gotta speak it to me a little bit more clearly, okay? So everybody, who's he? Elijah. Good. So he went to Zarephath. As he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks and he asked her, would you please bring me a little water in a cup? Next, as she was going to get it, he called to her, bring me a bite of bread too. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house. And I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last, this last, and then my son and I will, bruh, can you say trouble? Trouble. He said, she's broke. I said, can you say she's broke? She's broke. All right. So she was about to die. Next verse. But Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you've said. But there it is. That word, but it changes everything for all of our lives and in a lot of circumstances that we find ourselves in. But make a little bread for me first. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, there will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again, always. So she did as Elijah said, and she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. There was always enough. Can you say enough? There was always enough flour and olive oil left in the containers, just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. Wow. Praise God. Is there one more verse? That's it. Praise God. Okay. A couple of things that we can pull out of this, specifically in the season that we're in, which is to give, is that God will sometimes challenge your faith and he will challenge you in regards to generosity at the moments when you are struggling the most. I don't know if you've noticed that, but um, you might be going through moments where you don't have enough or you don't have a whole lot or... You might be in a moment where you're in a mess and the miracles right on the other side of your obedience in the midst of your mess. And it's tricky because um, we're, we're expecting God to move and we're expecting God to do something crazy, but we tend to forget that before God moves, he needs to set up the stage. We tend to forget that before God actually does something, it needs to get messy. Can you say a mess? We tend to forget that before God gives us a miracle, a mess has to happen. And this woman reached a low point in her life, kind of like some of you have reached a low point in your life. And it doesn't have to be with resources like oil and flour. It could be with the resources that God has given you right now in your present day. Or it could be something with your emotions or your heartbreak or your moment of finance. Or maybe you're going through a tough season because of loss. Whatever it is, whatever it is, we have to be Christians that we don't allow the moment of loss to determine our praise, to determine our actions, to determine our choices, to determine our feelings. We should not allow the things that are happening in the moment to determine whether if I'm going to stop or keep on going. You understand what I'm saying? And so this woman reached a very, very, very low point. And I don't think that we sometimes read with understanding. I don't think that we've ever read the story and really thought about the implications of what the story really meant. I mean, have any of you ever experienced, maybe some of you have experienced in this moment, have any of you, uh, any, ha- have any of you ever experienced a moment where you really only have one last meal to eat and that's it? Have you really gone through that? Do you know what it's like to die with someone you love? 
And maybe not all of you in this room, maybe some of you have gone through something like that because maybe Canada is not your firstborn country. It is not where you were born. But for the rest of us and the majority of us, we were born here in Canada or we were well off and we've always had something to eat. But this, this situation, this circumstance, is, it's much heavier than what we read on the surface. Just like the circumstance that you may be going through right now, it's so much heavier and deeper than what we read on the surface. You can come to church and smile and you can look great. You can have your hair did, your nails done, your makeup's on fleek, your outfit's just... So sometimes you look great, you sound great, um, you pretend really great, but your circumstance, your behind the scene problems are heavier harder, tougher than what appears to be in the surface. Yeah. We read this story on the surface, but we don't place ourselves in her moment. But we can relate to this woman because we have battles that we need to fight. And some of you don't need to fight them. Some of you are fighting them. And this is what boggles my mind the most. That every time we're in these deep moments, this is when God goes, all right, here's your next step. You're at your last bit of strength. Lift your hands and praise me. You feel heartbroken because they left you? I want you to fall in love with me. But I can't. I can't get over this, these feelings. I can't even listen to the sermon right now. Because my mind is over there even though my body is over here. Yeah, God is telling you, I want you to give on December 15th. And this has been the month that you've been the most broke. You've skipped giving presents to people for the last three, five years. And so you feel like you owe it to them. And now you're trying to split every little single dime that you have to buy presents this year. So that you don't look bad this year all over again. And God is saying extravagant giving on December 15th though. And it feels like, what? God, give me a break. And this is exactly how this woman could have responded. To the word of God. Remember that Elijah was a prophet. A prophet represents the word of God. And in the tough moment, this guy, the word of God, in this case right now, the word of God is telling you, give me my praise. I know that you don't have any reserves left in there. I know that you don't have any strength right now. I know that you don't have any feelings to do it right now. I know that you don't feel like you have the audacity right now to praise and to worship and to give and to engage and to serve and to preach. I know that you don't have that right now. But will you take a step? Will you take a step? Will you place my word before your emotions? Will you place my word before your worry? Will you place my word before your circumstance? Will you place me first? Because you've got to remember that the stage for a miracle is a mess. Some of you are waiting for God to open the clouds and give you everything. You're praying for the wife and you think that she's just going to appear in your room one day, although you really want that, right? Bro, you gotta get your money in order. You gotta get your career in order. You gotta go get your license. God's not gonna trust you with someone if you're on Translake all the time. I mean, you can't take, like I always say, you're not gonna take your wife when she's about to give birth on the bus. What if the bus is on strike? And you're trying to say, God, where are you? How come he gets a girlfriend? How come he got married? All my friends are married. Yeah, all your friends have careers and a license. So listen to me. Before the miracle happens, there's a mess. And there's a step of faith that you got to take. Some of you are waiting for the miracle. Some of you are waiting for change to happen. Some are waiting for you to be healed. Some of you are waiting for patterns to be broken in your life that you are not happy with. Some of you want to conquer the demons that you've been fighting. Some of you are seeking purpose and some of you are seeking meaning and you want to feel purposeful and you want to feel meaningful and nothing's happening. Or some of you are doing everything you can, like this widowed woman. So two, two things. One thing is that a miracle requires a response, but it requires a response in the mess. The miracle 
that you're waiting for, the promise, the breakthrough that you desire. It requires a step of faith in the mess. And faith is spelt R-I-S-K. This woman had only one meal left and she was going to die. What's the step of faith that you gotta take? What's the risk that you gotta take? Some of you have to leave those relationships and it's a risk because you feel tied to them and they've been there for you in tough moments. They, they, they love you for real, but unfortunately what overtakes them is something much stronger than what you could ever fight. And that is that they are not under God's influence and because they're not under a godly spiritual influence, they keep influencing you to do the wrong thing even though they love you. Yeah. So, so you need to get off Netflix. And you definitely have to stop chilling if you haven't put a ring on it. So it was a risk. Some of you have to take that step. Maybe for others of you, it's taking the step of serving and getting plugged into church. Because you come once in a while. That's good. But the devil's happy like that. Yeah. That you come once in a while. That's good. That you visit when you feel like you need that extra injection of, of, of God's spirit and his joy and his presence. God, I need to get that. You need to fill me up again. Fill me up till I overflow and then you disappear. <laughs> and that's, that's not right. Because then how can God work in you and through you if you're inconsistent? Because if you're waiting for, and, and, and this is why you don't change. And this is why we sometimes as human beings don't change because you want a miracle. Yeah. And while you're at your mess, it's an opportunity for your miracle. Mm. Your opposition is actually an opportunity. Yeah. And that is the greatest challenge to your faith. I'm going to say this very, 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 very clearly. On. One of the ways that God challenges your faith is for you to accept the fact that sometimes you have to live in a moment where opportunity and opposition, the miracle and the mess coexist, yet the only thing that makes the difference is your perspective. I'm gonna say that one more time because I think it's really good and I think that you need to catch this a little bit, okay? You ready to catch this? You ready to catch it? See, the greatest challenge sometimes to our faith is when we have to live in a season of our life where opposition and opportunity are actually coexisting and both the opposition is true and both the opportunity is true. Both the mess is true and both the miracle is true and we have to live in a place where they coexist while your perspective is the only thing that makes the difference. She was in a mess, but she had an opportunity. It wasn't her opposition. Both are true. She was going through a mess, but she was also standing right before the miracle. She was in a moment of opposition where everything was falling apart. Her emotions were good. Her heart wasn't good. Her mind wasn't good, but she was also at the brink of a miracle, and it was an opportunity when God said, let me ask for the little that you've got. So good. Both the miracle and the mess were true. And see, sometimes we give to God, we serve God, and we give up the things that we need to give up, and we feel like we lost because the miracle didn't come as quick as the widow's miracle. But can I submit to you that sometimes the greatest miracles are not something that you received, but instead it's something that's been released? Yeah, you probably didn't catch that, right? Let me, let me explain it to you a little bit better, okay? The relationship that you released five years ago today is a blessing that you received. Say amen. You go, I can't believe he left me. I can't believe she left me. And now you're saying, thank God he left me. I praise the God of all. Man, I praise God that man left me. He wasn't no man. He's a boy in a man's body. That's what he is. And so five years ago, you lost something. Five years later, the same thing you lost is the the main thing you received because sometimes 
both the mess and the miracle coexist and the blessing comes from the perspective that you choose to take. Let me give you another example of loss. I hope I get the job. I hope I get the job. How's my tie? How's my tie? <laughs> you go get the job. You go, you go for the job interview, right? You're so hyped about it. And then after your audition or after your interview, they call you and they say, you didn't get the job. I'm so sorry. And then you're like, me too. I'm so sorry. Mass miracle coexist. I'm so sorry. Yeah, man, shoot. I'm sorry too. All right, thank you for getting back to me though. At least I know I didn't get the job again. And then three months later, another opportunity opens up where you saw opposition. God's going, uh-uh, this ain't no opposition. This is my way, this is my way to bring a miracle. I need to show you a mess first to teach you. It's not you. It's not your how pretty I look. It's not how well put together you talk. It's not about how good you behaved either. It's about God's goodness, man. It's about his faithfulness, man. It's about his greatness, man. It's about how crazy God could work. It's about how beautiful God is. It's about how his mercies just overflow in my life when I don't deserve any type of goodness. Both the miracle and the mess can coexist. And three months later, you get this job that was actually 20 times better. This happened to me. I was in hairdressing school. I've been a barber for a while, and I went to hairdressing school. And after I, I built some cool relationships with one of the teachers there, she, was, uh, she owned her own barber shop. I was like, oh, I'm good. I graduated, I got a job. Well, she interviewed me, and her right-hand guy was also a friend of mine. He was young, exactly like me. It was a barbershop in North Van. And I went for my interview, whatever. And I had to cut a client's hair. The haircut was so bad that they didn't even charge the old man. He was 65. <laughs> and I'm like, what the hell happened to me? Like, what the frick? I know what, I've been cutting hair, guy hair for more than like five years already. Yeah, it was a mess. It was God setting up a stage. It was God setting up the stage through a mess to bring me my miracle because when they called me, they're like, hey, bro, you just didn't cut it. I mean, the haircut was just that bad. <laughs> I, I, and you know what? They didn't even call me back. They told me right there. <laughs> I didn't even finish the rest of the day. They're like, you can go home now if you want. I'm like, okay. Got it. And I was like, no, I'm struggling. <laughs> And I went home so sad. I had a few sheets to, uh, to catch up with um, at school. And so uh, after I graduated, I still went to go do some work. And then in comes in David Charles, a guy that we had been hearing about in our entire 11 months there at theory class every Tuesday. David Charles this, David Charles that, David Charles here, David Charles there. He owned a very, very successful hair salon in Kitsilano where tips are about $130. Clients come in there and they spend $800 to $1,000 per visit. And then David Charles comes in and everybody's like, oh, David Charles is here. <laughs> and then he goes, give me two of your best students. And they chose me and this other girl. I was like, what? <laughs> and I went for my interview and he asked me to do color on a girl, on a woman. And I, for some reason, nailed that really well. We bonded really well. We clicked. But he still had to interview that last, th th that second person that was in my class. But she freaked out and didn't go. She freaked out and didn't go because he was that big. He passed away in 2016 out of cancer, and it really hurt my heart. I led part of the funeral with him at this beautiful cathedral. He was so well known that his death actually made it in a newspaper. He was in the Vancouver Sun because he was really, he was that well known. Anyways, to cut the story short, um, I get a call back and he goes, hey, you want to start on Monday? I mean, on Tuesday, sorry. I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, did I just make it? <laughs> and the rest was history. Uh. It was just me and him working in that entire hair salon. I made really cool friends with people that were way older than me, very successful. He taught me a lot of things about life that I even apply them here. Uh at church and I teach to our volunteers. 
Little did I know that when I got rejected, well, not rejected, but when I didn't get accepted for that job at the barbershop in North Van in a mall, God was lining something up for me three months later that would be part of my training of Crave Church. Praise break! See, this woman took a risk to give up her last meal. She took a risk. She chose to live in between the coexistence of the miracle and the mess. Where are you at today? Fighting battles? Your perspective makes the difference. Because both the battle, the mess is true, but the miracle is also true. The miracle is also true. The miracle is also true. The blessing is also true. The promise is true. The breakthrough is true. God's providence is true. God's transformation is true. But your perspective, but your perspective, your perspective plays a role. Your perspective, your attitude plays a role. Some of you come into church, you're having a bad day, and you let everybody know that you're having a bad day. Guilty as charged here as well, right? You, you, we, we have to evolve as Christians and grow to become mature people that are solid in our faith. Right. Not just spiritual babies always going, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me. I need, I need, I need, I need, I need. This whole series is about I give, I give, I give, I give, I give. And it's not just money, 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 money. It's your attitude. It's your smile. It's your behavior. It's your engagement. It's your faith. It's your service. It's your smile. It's your smile. It's your engagement. It's your clap. It's your praise. It's your worship. It's your attitude. Behavior. It's your faith. It's your faith. It's your faith. Choosing to coexist. So that's the first thing I want to tell you. The greatest challenge to your faith is choosing to live in the right perspective while you coexist between the space of miracle and mess. Thank you for watching our weekly talk at Crave Church. A new sermon will be released every week, so make sure you subscribe and turn on your post notifications. With that, you'll be notified each time we upload a new sermon. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week.